Hello, my name is Shachar Shemesh. If you were expecting to see Chris, then uh, um, he didn't arrive. I'm his replacement, so you're in the wrong room. But you might as well stay because he's not going to lecture anything this conference, so uh, might as well stay. Um, topic today, a novel approach for uh, type promotion and function overloading, um, which means that I think I can do it better than the way C++ does it now. Uh, before we begin with that, um, I have a couple of words to say about myself. Um, you don't care about any of that, which is fine. Um, I, I will insist on highlighting this one uh, tidbit of information. Um, I'll get to what that actually means uh, uh, later. So, um, if I want to do this better than the way C++ does it, it means that I think there's a problem with the way C++ does it. That was actually the to topic of last year's uh, lecture. Anyone here been here, saw it on YouTube? No. Oh, one. Okay. Um, so I, I will do a um, hopefully quick recap of the problems I see. Um, there is, the last year's lecture is available on YouTube uh, on this QR. So um, either take it a photo of it now or wait for this to come up on YouTube and hopefully there'll be a link. Before we begin diving in, here's a, a code snippet from um, actual production code I've had. And this code has a bug. So I'll, I'll quickly go over what it does. And uh, I'm wondering whether any of you can see the bug. W um, this code is part of video frame grabbing. So the very first thing we do is we define the frame rate at which we work, which in this case is 60. And we want uh, um, std chrono delay, uh, uh, sorry, duration, um, which says what is the time difference between two frames? So we take the literal one second and divide it by the frame rate and put that um, into um, inter-frame delay. Um, so next we have an infinite loop that grabs a frame and then slips for that delay. And the question is, does anyone see the problem? This is supposed to run at 60 hertz. Yeah. Hmm? Very good. I'll get back to it th though. Uh, before we get to that problem, um, the pet peeve, never use sleep for, for that purpose. Um, the reason you don't want to use sleep for for that purpose is because if you use sleep four, this, this value does not take into account the time it takes us to grab the frame. So we'll have a drift, and even without the other problem, this will not give us 60 hertz, it will give us less. So what you want to do is, I'm using Google Slides and it doesn't work with the clicker. Um, if, if this is the main loop, what you want to do is replace it with something like this. You want to um, mark the beginning time. That's the time of your first grab. And then you grab a frame, and then you add to that timestamp the delay, and you use sleep until. This way, doesn't matter how long the, the uh, frame grabbing takes, you keep the 60 hertz you, you assign to yourself. So use that pattern, don't use the other pattern. But I'm going to use the other pattern in this example because I don't care about this problem and it's more code, so it's harder to read. Okay, back to the topic. This is a very sophisticated code. It's a function in the language called C++ that adds two numbers together. Do, do I need to go slower? Is, is, okay. And my question for you is, this line, 
How many casts happen in this line? Uh, just raise your hand if you think the number is zero. One, two, three, four, five. Undefined behavior. So uh, most of the class think it's more than five. Um, <laughs> oh, don't think at all. Uh, uh, yeah, um, raise your hand if you're not going to raise your hand no matter what I ask. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's, that, that's probably it. The, the thing is, um, this has three casts. Good news, it's not undefined behavior. But uh, the reason it has three casts is because A and B are uint8, which is, uh, belongs to a family of types that are called narrower than int. And C, and therefore C++, at the slightest provocation, will promote any type from that family to int. Why int? Because. Watch my previous lecture. But um, the thing is, the slightest provocation, in this case, we use a plus symbol, causes it to promote unsigned or signed 8 or 16 bit. We live in an era where we can pretty much assume that int is 32 bit signed integer. Um, it didn't used to be like that, but um, we can assume it now. So the slightest provocation, any type narrower than 32 bit gets promoted to signed int. So A gets promoted to signed int, B gets promoted to signed int, we add them as signed integers, and then we have to cast them to unsigned 8 bits because that's the return type of the function. And like the title of my last year lecture says, I consider that completely broken behavior. And that may sound like an hyperbole. I mean, what? Why would I care so much? All we did was promote a value that is smaller than int to int. There is no losses value. Sure, it's weird. I mean, int isn't the native word size of modern CPUs. It's not the largest integer supported by the compiler. It's just pretty much arbitrary at this point in time, but completely broken. Um, and the reason is, the promotion isn't the reason I call it completely broken. The reason I call it completely broken is the demotion. Here's the thing. Because C promotes to int, and therefore C++, with the slightest provocation, it has no choice but to demote anything of int size to the smaller types without warnings and without indications. And that doesn't apply only to cases where the compiler did the promotion. It applies generally. Let me prove it to you. I need to wear my glasses for that. So CPP. Right. Everyone can see? Um, this is C++. I need to click on the correct place. Um, here's what we'll do. We'll declare a function that returns int. I just wrote it. The compiler cannot know anything about it because I don't know anything about it because this function doesn't exist. This is all the compiler has to go by. And then we'll declare another, we'll, we'll just std int h so we can use the uh, verbose types. 
we'll do a function that returns u into 8. And all it does is return foo. That's all the compiler has. That cannot possibly be OK. We don't know anything about the return value. And we trim off 75% of the bits and just return it, changing it from signed to unsigned in the process. We, that cannot be OK, right? So surely our compilers will come to the rescue, right? So um, too many screens. OK. Um, make demotion.o will compile it with G++ without a warning. But maybe I wasn't aggressive enough. So um, let's add WL. More warnings. Nope. Uh, how about extra more warnings? How about super extra more warnings? How about another compiler? No warnings. And the reason there are no warnings is because the compiler cannot warn about this. It just happens too often. And that to me is completely broken. To be fair, there is one counterpoint I thought about, which goes, it's, it's this function. Uh, it says, if we want to average two numbers, and we want the brain dead algorithm to do that, what we're tempted to do is just add a and b and divide by two. And strangely, in this particular case, that works. The reason that works is because A and B get promoted to int. Int is wide enough to accommodate the overflow. And then we divide by 2. After the division by 2, we're guaranteed not to have an overflow. And the truncation works. And everything's great for this particular example. Because heaven forbid you replace u int 8 with a, a template and use int. We're back to the original problem. Overflow, not work. Well, if you use int, that's undefined behavior. Because overflow and signed integers is undefined behavior. So, but to be fair, there is this one particular counterpoint. So I thought I'd point it out. <coughs> We're not done. This isn't the only way in which the type, the integer promotion is completely broken. There is also, tell me if you hear this for the first time, the business of signed and unsigned handling. Who, who, for whom this is the first time they hear it? For whom my use of the word whom is, seems strange? <laughs> OK. There you go. Um, uh, uh, do I need to show you an example, or are you too familiar with that? I mean, um, we can actually go, we have the editor somewhere. OK, let, let me just. Just a second, I'm sorry about that. OK. Um, so um, again, let's use uh, STD int so we know what we're doing. And 
this time we'll actually want to print some stuff. And now we have um, compare, which uh, accepts uh, uint32t, a, and int32tb, and goes if a is bigger than b, is bigger than b. Otherwise, is smaller or equals. And now we go main. Compare 2 to minus 3. How did we call it? And it says 2 is smaller than minus 3. Smaller or equal. Now, to be fair, in this particular case, um, we do get assuming we compile again we do get a warning um, which is pretty um, pretty reasonable. It says you, you compared sign to unsigned. Of course, it's phrased signed unsigned comparison and you, the usual response is, is, is so what? But um, uh, it doesn't say you compare sign to unsigned, your result will be wrong, which is what it should have said. But um, at least we got a warning. Of course, I think that should have been an error. But at least we got something. And at this point, you're wondering whether maybe fixing it isn't all that difficult. Maybe we can um, allow the promotion, but error if there is a demotion. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's fixable. Well, here's the thing. Um, there is a language that tried to do precisely that, and it's called D. Um, I've uh, worked in D in the past. I worked at a company called Weka.io for uh, four years. Um, and um, here's what D says. It, it has several design goals and um, uh, two of them, the two relevant here, are these. The first is any expression that is legal in C and compiles in D has to have the same semantics in D as it does in C. That's the design goal of the language. The other design goal is we never implicitly truncate values. And that sounds exactly like what I just described, right? We do promote, we do not demote. Here's the thing. Um, I have the genuinely pleasure of implementing a RAID 6 algorithm in D. A lot of bit manipulations, an uh, uh, algorithm called uh, um, even odd. And the thing is, I wrote expressions, they kept being promoted and then tried to be demoted because I was using a single type, right? I was using signed eight, unsigned 8-bit or unsigned 16-bit. It kept being promoting, demoting, and erroring out. So I kept having to write explicit casts all the time. And that is annoying. 
to be fair, um, it's probably still better than what C does and C++. But still, very annoying. But if, if, if we started looking at other languages, I think there's um, uh, uh, the, the cool new kid on the block, or at least who used to be the cool new kid on the block until carbon arrived. Um, what does the language with the oxida oxidation does? So uh, this is the function the same average function um, that uh, um, I I written in uh, in Rust. Let's let's actually let's actually try it out. So um, so we define the the function. Um, it gets two arguments. Uh, a which is u8 and b which is u8 and it returns u8 and we, we just write the expression a, a plus b divided by 2 if, if we don't put the semicolon it, the block ends with an expression and since Rust allows uh, expression syntax then uh, that becomes the return of the return value of the whole function so I, I just put it like that. Uh, let's put in uh, main so we can uh, test it out. Um, one argument, and we want to average two and four. And we get three. That's great. However, let's check the interesting case. 252 and 254. And in this case, what we get is an assert. What Rust did is overflow, and it doesn't matter if it's signed or unsigned, is an assert condition. Which, by the way, personally, I think is an excellent choice. The, the, it, it makes much more sense than, than uh, C++'s signed integer is undefined behavior. Deal with it. Yeah? When you say assertion, uh, are you implying this only going to happen in the platform? I have no idea. I have no idea, but uh, um, either way, either way, I'm I'm okay with that. So so that that's effectively an assert. Yeah. I, I, I'll I'll point this out. Um, Wikio did software defined storage, and software defined storage is uh, one of the. It's not the most, but it's one of the most latency sensitive uh, industries out there. The uh, high frequency trading is more latency sensitive than software defined storage. But we, we would measure performance and latency in 100 nanosecond uh, units. We left the asserts turned on in the code. The, the performance impact they brought was uh, not big enough to justify removing them even for release build. So, even if that goes into release, I'm fine with that. It, 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 the, the amount of code written that is sensitive to that level of performance loss isn't large. Question? Okay. So, um, what if we want to fix this? The way we, 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 want the, we want to explicitly state the behavior that happens in C that make this function work. So the C way of fixing this is to uh, cast one of those to 16-bit. That would make it large enough to accommodate the overflow and everything else would follow if that were C. Because that isn't C, 
Rust does not care to try and add 16-bit and 8-bits together. Rust does not do the promotion. Fine, we'll do it ourselves. So uh, we promote this to 16-bit um, to as well. And then um, the division doesn't work because, ah, sorry, the division works but we get a 16-bit value and we're expected to return an 8-bit and it's completely reasonable that Rust will not implicitly cast a 16-bit value to an 8-bit return. So, but we know it's okay, right? So we'll cast the result. Except now the, 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 the cast operator binds with high precedence. So what happened is we casted the 2 to 8-bit, and now we're trying to divide 16-bit value by 8-bit value, and Rust won't allow that either. So um, we need parentheses. And now the good news is that it works. The bad news is that the expression looks like this. Which brings me to my next point, which is that I hate casts. I hate explicit casts. Let, let me try and c convince you why. This is an explicit cast in C. This is an explicit cast in C++. This is an explicit cast in D, and this is an explicit cast in Rust. What do they all have in common? Extra letters, extra characters. <laughs> the, even extra letters isn't correct. Um, uh, someone said they all have C except the C one, but. Um, <laughs> But it, as you know, if we didn't have C, we'd all still be writing code in uh, Basi, Pasal, and Obol. What they all have in common is that they all specify the destination type of the cast, but none of them specify the source type. Cast, the source type. Which kind of makes sense. It would be exceedingly verbose if they did. But it's also a risky operation because it means whatever comes in, we try to shove it into this 8-bit unsigned size hole. And if, if it doesn't fit, then we chop off the extra bit bits. And, and whatever it is, and, and the compiler won't complain, and it can't complain because that is what we asked to do. So the only same thing is to build a programming language that asks us to do it as little as possible, which is the exact opposite of what Rust is doing. And in a way, it, it's similar to, um, I, I don't know how many of you remember that when Windows Vista came out, Microsoft was under fire for, for lack of security. So they said, fine, you'd still log in as administrator because reasons, but anytime you actually want to do an administrative action, we'll halt everything and you'll have to approve it. And the result was that uh, uh, actually uh, Apple did a, a, a video make poking fun at them at that, where uh, every time uh, a PC tried to talk, there was this guy in a suit saying, hey, you're trying to make an observation, do you approve? Yeah, okay. Um, you kept saying approve, 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 approve. And by the time a real threat came along, you were so conditioned to immediately dismiss this dialogue that you had no chance of saying, wait, that doesn't make sense. And too many casts are exactly like that. If you keep having to legitimately cast, then you won't notice the one time where casting doesn't make sense. So the obvious question is, 
okay, you keep complaining. What's your solution? If you were to build your own programming language from scratch or in no alliance to any previous code, what would you do? And the answer is, it's hypothetical. I don't want to answer that. Thank you for coming. OK. <laughs> Let, let's ask another question. When I built a programming language from scratch, or in no alliance to any previous code written, what did I do? That's an answer I am willing to. That's a question I am willing to answer. So let me introduce to you the practical programming language. It's a project I started and then abandoned. It has no users, which makes me the best practical programmer in the world. <laughs> but if you're interested, um, uh, GitHub and uh, 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 forum with uh, the specs and, uh, and, and some very old news by this point. And it, it wasn't on the ballot when I started, but I had a bunch of big ticket items I wanted to, to check with this language, which I never got around to. But when I got to implementing the semantic engine, I realized that I am discontent with the integer rules as done by other programming languages. I need to start over. So it's a small ticket item, but I think it's an interesting one. So what is the design criteria? First of all, no set of rules implemented by a compiler will get it right 100% of the times. So we need to, to manage the, the, the use cases. We're saying, OK, sometimes we'll get it right, sometimes we'll get it wrong. What happens when we get it wrong? And there are two possible answers here. One is we introduce a bug into the program. To be clear, I completely view what C and C++ is doing as introducing bugs into the program. It's not, it, your only fault is not realizing that not thinking at that precise moment about all the complexities of integer rules in C and C++. That's your only fault on the matter. So if, if the options are this or producing an error message, then we prefer producing an error message. And in that respect, what D does is, is sort of the sweet spot, except it too often guesses wrong. So, but, but otherwise, the, the trade-off is pretty much correct. And the other thing, which should be obvious, is we want to minimize the amount of time that we send a user to do explicit casts, because explicit casts are dangerous. And then once we check those two, we also want to behave in a way that the user expects. We, we want the programmer to kind of know what's going to happen when they write the code. But notice this is secondary to the first two goals. So binary operations, that, that's what started this whole rant. Um, if you're comparing or if you're adding um, U8 to U8, the result should be U8. I mean, as especially if you assert that there's no overflow. There's no reason to change the type. If you're adding U8 to U16, U16. Right? And implicitly, you don't have to do anything. If this is U8 and you, this is U16, the result is U16. If you're adding U8 to S16, unsigned 8-bit to signed 16-bit, signed error, signed what? 
sine 16. How about if you add U8 to S8? Error. I, I, I decided to do something else, though. I decided to do it as 16. Now, it might eventually error, but it will error when we try to demote. So uh, in, in every single respect, this is a superior solution to erroring out at this point. Maybe we'll error later. Yeah. Why can't be S8? Because uh, U8 has the 0 to 255 range, and S8 has the one, minus 128 to 127 range. And the ranges do not, co none of them, none of the ranges completely uh, contained within the other. So if, if I just implicitly cast between them, I'm going to lose values. By the way, unlike D, D is perfectly OK with going between unsigned and signed 8 bit because it's the same number of bits. Their definition of truncating is reducing number of bits, not reducing usable values. So um, um, similarly, if I'm trying to add U16 to S8, I go up to S32. Notice that if, if I expand above the maximal width of the input values, I'll always go to signed. I'll never go to unsigned. And finally, if you do U64 plus S8, assuming U64 is the largest integer size, then that's an error. So at this point, let's go back to the example we saw at the beginning of the lecture and understand what, what the problem is. Interframe delay is a duration, a, a variable of type duration. But duration in STD Chrono is not a single type. It's a templated type. And it has um, a, a variable or template variable of type fraction that tells what the resolution is. And otherwise, it's an integer. So uh, uh, duration milliseconds is duration with a fraction of 1 over 1,000. Duration microseconds will be duration with a fraction of 1 over 1 million. Duration second, which is what this literal is, is duration with a fraction of 1 over 1. So this literal is, has the value of 1 with a fraction of 1 over 1. And then we divide it by 60 and we get 0. And then during the assignment, we convert this zero from duration second to duration millisecond, but by this point it's too late. It took me half an hour to find the root cause of this bug the first time. The second time, it took me a lot less. It took me about five minutes because I already remembered the, the root cause. But I think the main takeaway is that the best practical programmer in the world did produce this bug a second time. <coughs> so um, why does this happen? This happens because I know it's a bit small, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll try. Um, because generally speaking, this is how the compiler does type. This is how the compiler for every single programming language I'm aware of does type deduction. It starts with something called an AST, abstract syntax tree. So the parser go o goes over this linear string of uh, uh, characters, parses out and creates this tree which says, okay, we have an assignment operator and then 
uh, on the left we have interframe delay and on the right we have division operator which is this and that division operator is also a binary operator so on the left we have the one second literal and on the right we have the frame rate cool that's the syntax analysis then comes the semantic analysis and the semantic analysis always starts from bottom up the leaf nodes have a well-determined static type which in uh, our case is the uh, duration 1 over 1 int and duration 1 over 1000 L value which L value means left value because it's on the left of the assignment and then it goes, gets to the division operator and it needs to do overload resolution. It needs to pick a, a division operator. And the division operator is picked based on the input arguments. So it says, I need a division operator that gets um, a, a and B. A, should be, a is, should be a duration of 1 over 1 and B should be frame rate. It finds that division operator, in this case, by performing a template expansion. And then that overload has a return type, and that becomes the return type of this node. So the return type of this node, the duration 1, one over 1, is determined by the overload picked, determined by the arguments. And then we get to the assignment operator, and the assignment operator isn't exactly an overload, but let's assume that it is. And the assignment operator says, I need arguments that are duration 1 over 1,000 L value on the left and duration 1 over 1,000 on the right. Except this isn't duration 1 over 1,000. This is duration over 1, 1 over 1. So what happens next is that the compiler introduces a cast. Compiler says, okay, all right, don't panic. This is the wrong type, but I know how to fix this. I'll cast from duration 1 over 1 to duration 1 over 1,000. And in order to fix this code, what we need to do is we need to move this cast to happen before the division. Right? We need this cast to happen here. Here's the thing. When I started implementing practical and implementing the operators in practical, I got, I implemented two operators. And by the time I got to the third one, I looked at it and said, I can't do it. It's too complicated. The combination of deciding which, uh, uh, which promotions to do, and, and some of it was boilerplate code, and some of it was almost boilerplate code. And, and the actual operator, the part where we actually performed the, the instruction, was a, a meager one-liner at the end of a huge function uh, that couldn't be copied between the operators because of something called value range propagation, which I totally skipped over because I, I think I, don't, I won't have time to go into it. Something taken from D. And then uh, um, the realization hit me that None of this, as, as horrible as it is to me as someone writing the compiler, none of it is even applicable to user-defined types. User-defined types are not on the table as far as handling this. And notice this line. This is all user-defined types. None of it is C++ built-in types. And then the realization hit me that operators are just overloads. So instead of trying to implement the, the operators, what I need to do is figure out how I want overloads to work at practical. 
and um, to figure it out in a way that will allow me to implement the built-in operators the same way I expect a programmer in the language to implement operators for user-defined types. So it has to be reasonable. Sadly, that required four months of which I spent a ripping out the entire semantic part of the compiler I wrote that far. That was a bummer. And uh, B, trying to figure out what I want to do. Here's the thing, you get an expression. The expression contains a function call, either an operator or an actual function call. And then you pick up all the names that match that call and you need to pick one of those. That, that's the core issue here, right? Overload resolution. And I think the greatest understanding is if we go back here, is that we want to push, if we want this to work without explicit casts, we need for, to push the, the cast as further back in the tree as we can. Which means that I need to do something that, again, to the best of my knowledge, no other programming language in the world does, which is, you notice how type propagates up the tree here? We need to propagate type down as well. We need to say, okay, at the end of the day, what we want to do is an assignment, and there we need a duration of 1 over 1,000. So let's push back that knowledge towards the leaf of the, the tree so that the, the, the implicit cast will happen early, and all the operators since then will happen at the correct target type, which was not trivial. The, um, the main rule that governs here is that when practical evaluates expressions, it can work in either one of two modes. In one mode, is like in other languages where it doesn't know what the end result needs to be. If, if, think about it, if you do a function call and um, you just do a function call and then a semicolon, you do nothing with the function's return, then when the compiler evaluates this statement, the expression doesn't have an expected type. We don't know what to expect. The other mode, is where we do know what the expected type, such as during an assignment. So as we traverse the tree down the right-hand side of the assignment, we know what we want to get at the end. So we don't just traverse the tree. We traverse the tree, keeping in hand that we need a duration of 1 over 1,000. And if we're lucky, there's going to be only one matching function. And, and if there's only one matching function, it's easy. That's the overload we want. Now, you will notice that there are a lot of weird stuff here. And, and in general, we're kind of bending something which is quite accepted. We're working backwards from how people usually reason about programming languages. I think that's the most controversial part of, of this system. When, if you listen to I in Bal's talk yesterday, she said, she kept saying, and this is how the compiler picks the overload the user intended. So the reasoning goes from the user knows which overload they want to be called to the compiler has to guess that decision. And here it sort of works backwards. It says the user does not, is not the one that says, this is what I want. The compiler says, I'm trying to figure out what's best based on circumstances. 
that may be changing. You can take an expression and move it as a, to be a sub-expression of another expression, and the sub-expression will change semantics because of different context. It's something that to a human is very hard to reason about. But I'm going to try and convince you that that does make sense. All the overloads we're considering have the same name, have the same number of arguments, or at least potentially have the same number of arguments, and are defined, and it, these arguments, the, the arguments we provide can be casted to those arguments. So, so all of those overloads are confusable. Now, I would suggest that if you defined a bunch of functions that all have the same name, the same number of arguments, and those arguments may be confused with one another using implicit casts, but the functions don't, do, don't serve the same purpose, there's something wrong with your program. You're, you're asking for a bug to happen. So that's the, the assumption. Still, this is pretty extreme because I, I said, okay, one of the conditions where I said, yeah, you're probably okay, is the arguments can be implicitly cast. But here I picked the, the correct overload based solely on its return type. What if the arguments don't fit that? Anyone? Error, compilation error. Remember, it's okay to guess wrong so long as you don't introduce a bug. And I'll notice that very briefly in Walter's lecture within a lecture, the following statement was on screen. So following expression. What is this dot? It's the exact same bug we've just seen, right? It's, it's to, to create one as a floating point rather than an integer. But wait, square root accepts a double. Is, is this the correct width? Answer, I don't know. But why should I be bothered with that question? If square root accepts a double, why shouldn't this be a double by, by the mere fact that it's been passed as an argument to square root? And that would mean that the dot is also unnecessary because it would propagate down and both one and three would be uh, cast to double because that's what square root accepts. What, a, a, so I said, uh, we pick the overload based on the return type. What if there is no overload with the exact return type? Or for that matter, what if there are multiple? And uh, the answer is that this gets kind of complicated, but it gets even more complicated. Because just think about it. What if I have, uh, 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 if I call a function, and that function, one of its argument, is another function call? How common is that? You're probably not going to have a lot of operator plus returning double, but you probably are going to have a lot of operator equal equal returning boolean. Quite a few, in fact. And what's more, the inputs to those operators will probably be logic functions of their own, or, or sorry, or, or, or arithmetic functions of their own. So you have this tree where there's a whole section in the middle that is completely unbound. <coughs> I won't go into all the details, but 
essentially what practical does in this case is it checks all the combinations and it assigns weights to each combination. It checks based on how many, con how many casts it needs to do and which cast, because not all casts are equal. We, if we have a U8, we prefer promoting it to U16 than to U32. So it does that. I'm almost out of time, so I want to show just one more, uh, something which I think is really, really cool. I said I don't like casts. I don't like casts because explicit casts define this hole shaped as the destination type and then takes the input value and tries to shove it into that hole no matter how, how much it doesn't fit so long as it is at all possible. But what if we could have a milder cast? What if we could have a cast that will only implement, it will, can only be implemented using implicit casts? So we have an explicit, implicit cast. Now, under normal circumstances, that is pretty useless. However, in this case, such a cast can set the expected, explicitly set the expected type for that expression. And that can be used to select an overload. And you will notice, in practical, you can define multiple overloads that are received this identical arguments, but differ on return type. In fact, I considered defining literals that are overloaded. So you can have pi, and you have floating point pi, and double pi, and depending on context, you get a different one. I didn't in the end. I, there were other complications. But that's possible. And I call this the safe cast. If C can call an operator based on the number of arguments it receives, I think that's a valid name. So if we look at the uh, rusty monstrosity we had before, the practical equivalent is this. We, we, oh, we need only set the end result expe expected type of the argument to U16. It will automatically promote all of those to U16, so there will be no overflow, and then we do need a demotion, but the same value range propagation that I didn't have time before to, say, to explain what it is would again kick in here and make the compiler realize that it can do this demotion safely. So that's uh, uh, the end of this lecture. Uh, love it or hate it, you can't deny it's novel. Um, this is a quote of me. <laughs> it is now lunch, so um, um, you can either run off to, to eat or ask me questions. Either one is okay by me. Yes. Okay, so uh, um, the question was, uh, does it work only on integers? And uh, quite the contrary. This was built for integers, assuming it can only, can you also work on user-defined types? In fact, the code in the compiler that generates those operators is very simple. It, it, it used to be gener automatic generated functions, ge functions generated by code, and, and now I just list them out because there are so few of them. I just need U8 and U8 to A U8 and U8 16 to U16 to U16. Just a second. Um, the the thing I did not have time to go into is the value range propagation and the weights to the casts. And basically, uh, the casts are, can fall into three categories. The, they are purely implicit, only explicit, and those that can be implicit based on value range. And you can define those for user defined types as well.
return values or parameters causing surprising casts? No, generally speaking, whenever a, an explicit cast is needed, I have a problem with that because it means I'm, I'm, I'm lacking guarantees on what comes in. Okay, then I'm misunderstanding then. That's fine. Okay. Like I said, you, you have to admit it's novel. I, I just feel like this is doable in this case because there are simple expressions right there in this query which act as an argument. But imagine that one divided by three is each inside another function or you compute it inside a polynomial function. I don't, I couldn't imagine how. So, so, so that was the, uh, the question was if, if it's more complex, if it, it isn't just one divided by three passed to square root, which at, this, at the square root point, we know what the expected value is. Um, what if there's more functions in the middle that need to be resolved as well? That they have overloads and I have, we have multiple options for them. And the answer is, uh, we do recursive descent to scan all the possible options, but we do it smartly in a way that we only invest compiler time in options that um, that, that makes sense, that aren't already too expensive. And also, if the user thinks that the compiler is too slow, they can also help us along using the expect the safe cast. Right. So imagine you have a function called f, and inside f you return 1 divided by 3, right? And then you square root of f function f. Does that imply that, I mean, in practical, every function is like a template, and you can tweak the following? No, 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 no. Okay. The question. The, 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 the question was whether if, if we have square root of f of 1 over 3. No, no, square root of f. And f returns 1 over 3 is equivalent. No, no, the, we don't look into f. We just ask how many overloads of f we have. And then we need to pick one. So it wouldn't work in that case. So would if, if, square root, if square root has overloads and f has overloads and we have no expected value for or expected type for the entire expression, so we're free to choose any, any overload of square root, then we will get an error saying ambiguous resolve. So in the square root example, if it wasn't the square root example, yeah. okay, yeah, go on. Yeah, would you probably, if you can convert a string to a file, because there's, an, there's a function, there's a process for a file that gets a string, which is the path, would you propagate down the file type to the part of the path that I'm trying to add to Java? The C++ is any uh, a constructor that accepts or can accept a single argument is uh, uh, an implicit cast unless you, you explicitly forbid it is one of the cardinal scenes of the language. The, the, the language uh, 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 has, uh, I have a lecture called what you don't know can hurt you and it just has three points and this is one of them. Um, so it makes no sense to build a, a, a file user type that has implicit cast for implicit from string to file. It doesn't make sense. And if you do it anyway, then giggle, garbage in, garbage out. Purpose. Replace meaning with purpose and I'd go along with yeah. that statement. Yeah. But the thing is, I, I'm not saying this is what I want to do. I, I, I have a concrete implementation. You're free to download it and, and criticize concretely. I'm, I'm talking about the motivation. My motivation the entire motivation behind practical 
was to create a programming language that will reduce the small frustrations of programming. The areas where you know what you, you, you mean, the compiler ought to know what you mean, but you still have to explicitly move out of your zone, move out of your flow of trying to get the problem you're working on resolved in order to tender to the compiler's or the language's quirks. Well, uh, the generic problem is unsolvable. However, um, the, the guiding principle here is if I'm going to guess wrong, I want to guess wrong in a direction where I'm telling you I guessed wrong rather than in a direction where I'm going off and doing something you didn't intend me to do. I think we can get to have a, a compromise that is much better than the compromises we currently have available. Thank you.